Welcome to your first official session of the USET conference. Are we excited? I feel bad that I got to miss our friend from Moose Jaw. I assume he was very entertaining. So hopefully you'll get to see some more from him today. I think he's on the schedule a couple more times. Um, I welcome you to this session. My name is Jared Covilli. I'm a trainer for the Utah Education Network. Uh, I recognize a lot of familiar faces, so we're glad that you're here in our session today. Um, I didn't know how many people were going to be in here, so I put a handout online, okay? So if you want to write this down, uh, this is where my handouts are. Um, on my MyUEN page, my number is 58239. So if you're used to the MyUEN system, it's my.uen.org, a slash, and then my particular number is 58239, okay? So um, this session is going to be a little bit of more demo. I'll try and get a couple things that maybe we can do together if you've got a handheld device or something and you want to try it. We'll see if we can get you to do a couple things with me. But I want to show you just a few things that maybe you haven't seen about Google before, right? So we're going to jump into several different tools and kind of explore just some of the hidden features and some of the new options that uh, maybe you haven't seen and maybe a couple that you have, right? But we'll show you some different ways to use them. So uh, that's just what I wanted to get started with. Now, when I start my sessions, I'm a huge video guy, and I always want to start my session with a video. So um, one of my favorite phrases is, well, it's not brain surgery, right? You hear that all the time. And sometimes when you come to a conference like this, everything seems like it's brain surgery. Like you get so much stuff coming at you. I want to show you what happens when you invite a brain surgeon to your party, OK? So let's take a look at this clip. Yeah, something soft, I'm dying. Parking is absolute nightmare around here, isn't it? And for reverse there's the tiniest of spaces. So, I managed it. I mean, parking is not exactly brain surgery, is it? <laughs> and I should know. What's that? You're a doctor? Yeah, I'm a doctor. I'm a brain surgeon. Big difference. Big difference. Yeah, I actually know a joke about this. What's the difference between a doctor and a brain surgeon? One's not exactly brain surgery, the other is brain surgery. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what do you guys do? I'm an accountant. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I could do with an accountant. Filling in those tax forms can get really confusing, can't it? Still, it's not exactly brain surgery, is it? <laughs> I mean, brain surgery, believe me, is very complex. Are you an accountant too? No, I work for charity. Oh, that's a very selfless job, isn't it? I really admire you. I don't think I would ever do what you do. <laughs> I say that because it's emotionally draining, not because it's hard. <laughs> I mean, it's not exactly brain surgery, is it? <laughs> Which, as a brain surgeon, is what I do. I don't know who's a drink. I was brain surgeon, you know. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned it. So, Jeff, have you worked across? Uh, well, I'm a scientist. Uh, I work mainly with rockets. It's, uh, <laughs> it's um, pretty tough work. Um, what do you do? Well, I don't mean to boast, but uh, I'm a brain surgeon. Brain surgeon? <laughs> oh, it's actually rockets, I think. <laughs> Okay, so anytime you feel overwhelmed, it's not exactly rocket science, is it? So, Well, today we're going to jump in and I want to show you a few different ideas. The first thing that I want to show with you, uh, how many of you have a Google Calendar currently that you're using? Okay, I want to show you one of the little hidden features that I think is a really nice idea about using your Google Calendar. So one of the big things that I find, and I apologize, I'm going to have to come over here. My cable only goes so far, so I'm going to project my voice, right? Um, but when you get into your Google Calendar, one of the big things that a lot of us want to do is we want to be able to share our classroom events with our parents and students, right? But the problem is parents and students don't always want to go to your classroom calendar to see your events. When you think about what most parents want, what do they want? They want to check it on their mobile device, right? So one of the cool things that you can do with your Google Calendar is Parents can actually subscribe to your classroom Google Calendar, and then it can show up on their mobile device. So I wanted to take just a second to make sure you know how to set that up, okay? 
So the first thing that you need is when you go into your, I'm going to go to my, one of my kids' uh, websites for their school. My kids go to Oakwood Elementary in Granite. So if we've got some Granite people, there's your shout out. Hey, Granite. <laughs> okay. So here's Oakwood Elementary. Now, when you go to their website, this is kind of interesting here. Um, they have a Google Calendar on their home page, but it's kind of, they've made it, they've disguised it a little bit. But if I come down to the calendar here, one of the options, I'm going to blow this up so you can see it a little bit better. Do you notice here it's got a Google Ad option? So all the Google calendars will have a little option down on the bottom of the calendar that asks you to subscribe to the calendar. So this is the first step you'd want to tell parents about is you want to tell them to subscribe to your classroom calendar. Once they click on that button, you'll see that it launches my Google Calendar. And it asks me if I want to add the calendar. So okay, so I'll add that calendar. Now, this is a bad week for Oakwood because they're on spring break, so there's not a whole lot going on. But if I go to the next week there, you can see here's Oakwood Elementary stuff, right? So there's their school calendar showing up in my Google Calendar. Now, I'm just going to quickly flip over, and I want to show you two little things that you've got to do. Um, I'll go to my phone in just one second. Um, but there's a lot of different things that you can do in order to make Google Calendar show up on iOS devices. There's just one little trick that most people don't know about. And it's a website. Let me blow it up so you can see it here. It's google.com slash calendar slash sync select. This allows people to sync multiple calendars to their iOS device. Okay? So when they do that, this is what comes up. If they click that link, so google.com slash calendar slash sync select. This is what shows up. It pulls open their Google Calendar, and they just go through and pick which of the calendars they subscribe to that they want to show up on their phone. So if I click on Oakwood Elementary here and save this, I've already done it. Now when I come to my phone, let me just show you what happens. Okay, give me just one second to switch over to my phone, and we'll show you how cool this is. So here comes my phone. Now if you've done this in the past, you've gone into your settings, right? And you go into mail, contacts, and calendars, and you just have to set up one that's got the Google account. So a parent would just go into their Google account. They've already subscribed to your classroom calendar. And when they get in there, they just turn on that they want to sync the calendars. Okay. Once they sync those calendars, look what happens when I go out to my calendar, uh, my iCal app, okay? As I come into my iCal app, and I go down to the calendars option at the bottom, look what's in the list now. Oakwood Elementary is one of the calendars in my list. So like I said, it's a couple of steps, right? First they have to subscribe to your calendar. And then they just have to go to that sync select to tell Google that they want it to be part of the mobile device. And it will automatically populate in their calendar list. So when they go into next week, let's go to next week so we can see some stuff, there's the Oakwood Elementary calendar showing up on my mobile device. I don't have to go to the teacher website every time I want to see what's going on in the calendar. I know that's a couple of steps to set up, but it's one of those things that once parents realize that they can have it on their mobile device, They'll check your calendar more often, won't they? Because it's right there with all the other events and they can see that very quickly. So if you've never seen that before, the key link there, once you get people to subscribe, was google.com, whoop, let me switch back to my computer. Google.com slash calendar slash sync select. There it is right there. Okay. And that's good for you, too. If you have a couple of different calendars on your Google account that you want to sync, personally, right, I sync my wife's calendar and my calendar. I want them both on my phone. That's the same steps, right? Just going in there and telling it that you want a couple different calendars. They both show up in your list. That way you don't have to uh, always go to the Internet to search for those kinds of things. So something kind of new. I hope that you hadn't seen that one before. Just a new, I think, a little bit more effective way to share Google Calendar with other people. Okay, let's jump into another one that I want to share with you today. Um, how many of you are using Google Drive to collect student homework? Anybody doing that out here? So not a lot of us yet, right? 
And I can imagine some of the reasons why. If you're a secondary teacher, do you really want to get 180 assignments coming into your Google Drive and filling up your library? I mean, that can be kind of overwhelming, right? But I want to share with you a, a little application that's found in Google Drive that I think can save you quite a bit of headache if you try and do this. So this is going to be really good for especially the districts who are using Google for their infrastructure. That's about half of the districts statewide. I'm just curious, how many of you are in a Google district right now? I figured a lot of you. That's why you came to this session, right? So if you're a Google district, here's one of the things that you can do. Okay? I'm going to run a little application called Doctopus. So octopus with the D at the front, right? So Doctopus. Okay? There's a couple different ways to do this. You might see some other sessions that tell you some other ways. I'm just going to show you one that I've kind of played with that I like, and I'll explain a couple of the reasons why. So when I come into my Google Drive, the first thing that I've got to do is I need to create a spreadsheet. And in the spreadsheet, I only need two pieces of data for my students. I need their names and I need their email addresses. Okay? I'm going to open up my spreadsheet that I've created already. So I've got a really small class, right? I've only got a few students in it. But you can see there's my overwhelming group of students. And here's how I get started with Doctopus. Now, Doctopus is not already installed in your Google Drive library. You have to install it. It's found inside the spreadsheet when I come up under the Insert menu. Let me blow this up a little bit so you can see it a little bigger. If I come into the Insert menu, it's going to be found at the bottom of this list. It's a script. And I don't want to get too technical on scripts and those kinds of things. It's just a computer program that somebody's designed that has a specific purpose, right? And this job is to manage folders and assignments. That's what this script does. So when I come down and I select that I want a script, okay, you can see there's even another one here, a newer one called G, cl uh, G class folders. That kind of does the same thing. I'm going to just do a quick search on this. It's called Doctopus. Okay, helps if you don't have typos. So there's Doctopus. And you can see that Doctopus, it basically says it manages and helps you score student work when it's, a, when it's submitted to your account. So I'm going to install that. Okay. That just takes a second. And you do have to authorize it because it's going to say, hey, in order for me to run, I've got to be able to get into your Google Drive and do a couple things, right? So I have to come down and say, yeah, I'm going to let you play around with that stuff in my Google Drive. Now, that's installed. You'll see up here in my file menu, I've got a new file menu called Doctopus. Okay? Let's run that. So the nice part about this is when you install it, because I know I'm going to share a lot of stuff with you. You're going to learn a lot of stuff at this conference that so you won't remember. It. How does Doctopus work? That's a nice link, right? So there you go. That one has a video that goes through and shows you how to do all this stuff again. Um, really nice, though. Very simple for, to watch and kind of go through. But let's launch it and just kind of show you how this works. The one thing that I think is a little different with this than all the other systems that I've seen is you control when documents go to the students. You can actually turn them on and off. So if you have a due date that's a week from now, and on that due date you don't want students to work on that document anymore, you're the one that controls that from here. You can turn it off and the kids, they switch from having editing rights to viewing rights on their document at that point. So I mean, it really does give you more control than simply just doing a file share, right? Where a student shares their file with me and I have access to it. It gives me a little bit more control. It also gives me options like this. Let's show you. When I click on sharing type, I can break students into different categories. I can have this assignment be in groups. I can set it up so that every student gets the same project. Or I can differentiate. And I can give different kids different levels of the assignment based upon where they're at. So you can see that there's a lot more control when you do something like this. I'm just going to pick that we're going to do individual all the same. And now when I come down, it says, well, what level of access do you want to give everybody? Do you want to switch it to 
only give view or only comment rights. No, I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to allow all kids to edit. Okay. When I come down the sheet just a little bit, it says, what column do you want to use to get their email addresses? That's why I put that in there. And then you can see my other column, ask me for their names. Everything's fine, so I'm going to save this. And there's the octopus. I think it looks kind of like a lion and something else, but that's okay. The guy's not an artist, but he is a programmer, right? So we'll give him credit. Now it says, what folder do you want to put your document in? So I'll come here and grab my handout that I want to give all my students. I just put all my handouts in a folder and it says, okay, which one do you want to give to the kids? Now I come and I grab the, ha the homework assignment. I save that. And what happens on the other end, the students, once I select the handout that I want to give all of them, when they go to their Google Drive, the handout shows up. The handout's there and now they have access to work on it. I can select a folder to put that in, so I'll just say create a new folder for me. And then I can send an email to the students as well if I want to. So let's just say I want to send them a, a file that uses to their name. I want to name it with their name and I'll call this homework. So I'm just telling them to name that file with their name and kind of work through it that way. Last step down here is I save this and it's going to notify the students that they've got a new assignment. Here's the back end now, the last kind of little step. I'm going to say go ahead and run this. Okay. It goes through and look what it does with that little spreadsheet that I just made. This takes a second for this to finish. I'm on wireless, so we're crossing our fingers just a little bit when this happens, right? Okay. I may, in the interest of time, close this just for a second because it's going slow. But look what it just created. It, I didn't let it finish, right? But it gave me in my spreadsheet, look, it gave me links to every student's homework. It gave me a timestamp, so it tells me when they last edited the assignment. It's got a spot for me to put in their grades and my written feedback. Anything that I put in any of those fields, I can share back with the students in their assignment. Okay? And that's all in one spot. I think that is so much more effective than trying to share files back and forth with 180 kids or 35 kids or whatever you have in your classroom. You just create a spreadsheet now that goes out and does all the back end work for you. At any point when I want to look at a student's work, I can click on their name here and it will take me to the, their document in their Google Drive so I can look at it. So if you haven't seen this one before, I know it's a little bit advanced, but again, if you've tried to do this before, every, anytime you're trying to do a lot of file sharing back and forth this way, you've got to have a good way to manage those files. A lot of times it's you trying to go in and look at different file folders to set all of that up. I think Doctopus can do a lot of that for you. Okay? I'm just kind of curious, have any of you played with this one? Has anyone played with this one? Does it work pretty much the way I've described? Yeah. So it's kind of, like I say, for me as an old language arts teacher, I would love to do this with those reports that I was constantly shifting back and forth, right? But that's kind of a fun one that maybe if you haven't seen, can help save you some time and some headache when you're dealing with a lot of documents. Okay. I have a two second thing to show you. This is one of my nine things. Google just barely put this out. A lot of times when you're using Google Drive, we focus in on some of the limitations of the tools. Like we say, oh well, the spreadsheet tool is okay, but it doesn't do this, this, and this, right? But one thing that I notice about Google Drive is they're constantly updating the tools. And because it's cloud-based, just one day you log in and it's got a new tool, right? It's got a new option. Well, this was an option that came in about two weeks ago that I just wanted to show you. So if you have images in your PowerPoints, if you click on the image, you just got a new tool that lets you do picture editing right in your Google Drive, in your presentation. So if I come up here, I can make this image, I, got, I have two different options with it. One is to crop the image, 
So if you bring in an image that's full size and you only want to show part of it, you can see that I can come in here. Oh, I'm on the wire. I'm on the wireless. Let's see if it'll do it. It's thinking about it. Give me one sec. The, I, I think I got back in. Let's see if I can do it now. So if I click on this image and then I go up to the crop option, you can see it puts some new little handles on my image and I can crop that image right here in my Google Drive. Okay, so I can kind of play around with that image and it will only display what's in the non-cropped section, right? One other thing that's kind of fun in this new tool is it gives me an option to actually mask my image with different shapes. So if I want this picture to have rounded corners instead of to be a regular rectangle, I can click on one of the options here and you should see, let me select it and do that. Let's see if it got it that time. Yeah, notice there that it can do some kind of fun shapes with your images. So it just takes your regular image, you assign it to a shape, and now your picture's got the shape. One of those new little features that they're constantly putting into the programs, if you hadn't seen that one, uh, go play with it next time you make a little PowerPoint or a little presentation in there. I think your students will like that one because it's just a little bit more creative, right? Instead of always just having static images, you can do things with arrows and uh, kind of the POW sign and all that kind of fun stuff. So little new tools that they're putting into uh, Google Drive. Okay. Well, let's try something together here for a second. This is an old one, but there's still a lot of you in the room that haven't seen this one, so I want to do this one together. Um, two things that I want to share with you. A lot of you using Google Forms right now? Yeah? So if I want you to take this quiz right now that I put up here, just this little survey, how am I going to get you to this website? Look at that URL that I've got up there. docs.google.com slash forum slash d slash i. I'm not even going to say it all, right? There's too much stuff there. So a lot of you are going to say, well, copy that and use tiny URL, right? That's a good one to use. Tiny URL is a good one. Uh, any others that you like out there? Bitly is another really good one. I want to show you the one that comes from Google. And there's kind of a fun way to do that. Um, I'm just going to take and copy that big, long, scary address. And I'm going to go to a website that Google put out a couple years ago called Google, spelled G-O-O -O dot G-L. So it's a URL shortener. So that's nothing special. If I paste my big, long, scary address in here, it'll do just like Bitly and just like the rest, right? It'll give me a shortened version of it. If you want to take the quiz with me for just a second, if you want to take this, will you write that down? It's case sensitive there at the end. So it, it looks like it's capital DP, lowercase q, capital N, and then lowercase ej. I just put together a little quiz about you set so we can show you something here. Okay? So Google, geo.gl slash, capital D, capital P, lowercase q, uppercase N, E and a J. Now, a lot of you I know aren't using la laptops. I see a few laptops out there. What most of you are probably using is uh, one of these guys, right? So how many of you have your QR code reader on your phone right now? So here's one of the cool things about Google. If I click on this details option, there's my QR code. I'm going to blow that up nice and big. So if you want to scan that QR code, go ahead. You can pop that onto your mobile device and then you can take my little quiz, okay? So if you want to take a quiz about USET, you can scan our little QR code there. But how easy is that? You shorten the URL so you can put that into an email or you could write that on the board. But if you have a classroom set of iPads or you're sharing that with students that have mobile device access, you can just pull up that QR code and you don't have to do two different places. You don't have to shorten it in one place and get a QR code in another place. You can do it all at that Google. Okay? So it's all right there at Google. Now, I'm going to take this little quiz real quick. I've got to see what time I'm doing it. I'll give you one minute to take this if you want. So here are your questions. Where were the last three schools to host USET? Have, have any of you been to the last three USETs? Well, if you had to go more than three USETs to get to three schools, because we were at Jordan for like five years. No, we weren't. 
it felt that way for some of the people in Jordan District or in Canyons District. But so where have we been lately? Okay. I don't know if you heard it in the keynote, but I'm sure they told you the theme for this year's U set. Last year we got in trouble because we didn't have coffee at the conference, so you got to tell me is coffee available this year? Okay. We've got all kinds of beverages for your drinking pleasure here, right? Yeah, well, a lot of caffeine, not very much decaf. I'm... Here's another question for you. How many vendors do we have at the conference this year? Have any of you kind of explored the little handout that we gave you for boxes with vendors? And then the last question, we have two different keynotes. Are both of them from Canada? You know one of them is. The question is, did we go all Canuck with our keynotes this year? Okay, take one second and fill that out. I'm going to fill out my end so that I can create an answer key here in just one second. Thanks. So let's go through the answers real quick. The last three schools that held USET were Murray, Taylorsville, and Jordan. The theme for this year's conference is Spotlight on Learning. We learned that coffee is now available. There are 50 to 60 vendors down in the vendor hall. And both keynote speakers are from Canada is true. If you didn't know, our keynote tomorrow is also from Canada. So I'm going to submit my answers. Now, I want to show you what happens on the back end of this, right? So if I come into my Google Drive here, I've got my spreadsheet now that's giving me all of your responses, right? There's everybody's responses. Okay. Now, I've shown this in the past, but in case some of you haven't seen this before, if I'm using this as a form of assessment, I don't want to go through and look at every one of your answers to see whether or not you got it right. I want the Google form to do that for me. And one of the options here in the spreadsheet, again, it's under that insert menu, is I can insert a script that will grade all of your answers for me. So I absolutely love this little tool. I use it all the time. It's a great way for me to get a quick little assessment going. So I'm going to go back under that insert menu again. And I'm going to insert another script. This one also has a funny name. It's called Flubaroo. Okay, it's called Flubaroo. Now more of you have seen this one. This one's been around for a few years, but in case you don't remember how to do it or you've never tried it, I just want you to see how easy this is to use. I'm going to install Flubaroo in my spreadsheet. And it will do just like the last one. It will just ask me to authorize it so that it can actually access all my information. Okay, so I'll accept that. It says it's installed. So here we go. If I come back out to my spreadsheet now, there's Flubaroo. Okay. I'm going to come in now and I'm going to grade that assignment just using the little Flubaroo drop down menu. So it pulls open, it lets me pick how many points I want to make each question worth. Everything looks fine. I'm going to continue on that. Now it asks me which one I want to use as the answer key. Now of course I did something really dumb here. What did I miss? I should have put in a spot for names, right, so I could pick mine. We'll just use the last one because whoever filled it out at 1113, that was after I gave the answers, I hope they got them right. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to click continue on that. So it's going to base all of your scores off of whether or not the last person got the answers right. So we'll hopefully have a plant out here who did this appropriately for us. Normally what you should do though is ask a question that's got name on it, right? So that I can just pick the right answer key when I take the quiz myself. But look what it's putting together here in just two seconds. It puts together a nice spreadsheet and it shows me Okay, your scores. Oh, wait a minute, that didn't give me enough. Uh, did I, I must have had something selected. Uh, oh, here it is. It says 44 times it was submitted by the same person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, put the name on it, right? <laughs> put the name on it. So it has 44 random submissions. But you can see the nice part about this is it goes through and it creates, uh, creates a nice little spreadsheet for you. If you see questions in orange, 
That means that collectively as a group, we didn't perform well on this question. If I see a student's name and it's highlighted in red, that means individually that student didn't perform well on that question. Okay? So for me as a teacher, I can either remediate with the whole group if we have a question that we missed, because it means one of two things, neither of which is really good for me, right? If I see that everybody missed a question, what are my two things that I know about that question? I know that either it was a really bad question, or what's the other thing I know? I, I didn't teach it, right? I didn't cover that material well. So if I see an orange, it's probably on me, because if I've got 35 students that all missed it, it's something to do with either my instruction or my question. Uh, if I see just a few students in red, though, and most of the students aren't in red, that tells me individual kids that I need to go work with, right? So that's a nice little feature for me. Really easy to use. One of my favorite tools in Google Drive is to put together little short assessments and have the students use them. And now you've seen a fun way that you can use the QR codes as part of that. Very quick and easy way to grab a QR code and use that in an activity. So hopefully, have some of you used Flubaroo? Some of you played with that? Really cool. So fun to see that some of you are starting to use that one. Okay. We are going to try something here. Uh, let's see if we can get this to work here. So this is something that a lot of you have probably heard of, but maybe less of you have experimented with this in your own class. So a couple of years ago, Google put out a little feature called Google Hangouts. And Google Hangouts are like your Skype, okay? Except they do a few things different than Skype does. Two things that are really neat features that you can do in Google Hangouts that you can't do in Skype. Number one is in Skype, you have one-to-one -one video communication, right? I can bring somebody in and we can have a one-to-one -one chat. In Google Hangouts, how many people can I have in there? I can have nine additional people besides me. So I can have a whole group talking with each other, or I can work with... Uh, People across the district, I can bring in guest lecturers, I can do all kinds of fun stuff. Here's the other feature, though, that maybe you're not familiar with with Google Hangouts. You can actually take your Hangout, and instead of just having it go between the two groups, you and the other people that are in the Hangout, you can actually broadcast that online. So you can take your Hangout that you're doing with somebody in your room, and you can make that available online if you wanted to for a larger audience. So you can imagine, if you had that guest speaker come in, and you have students that are absent, this could be a way that you can share it with the students, right? You can turn on a little feature called Hangouts on Air, and that gives you a chance to broadcast that. So the questions are, where, do you, where does it broadcast, right? So there's two things you need to know about where it broadcasts. It'll broadcast to your YouTube channel, if you have set up your YouTube channel. Just so you know, if you have a Google account, you have a YouTube channel. You just maybe haven't ever used it. So if you go into YouTube and you log in with your Google account, you can click on your little icon up in the top right corner and ask if you want to go to your channel. And that's where the video, if you do a Google Hangout on air, will be broadcast from your channel. The other place that it can be broadcast is from Google Plus. So Google Plus is kind of Google's little social networking site. Um, I wanted to have Jared over here. He's going to tell us a little bit about this. Jared's a geography teacher from the Davis School District. And he's done something pretty cool with this Google Hangouts on Air in his class. So I'm going to let, just have him come up and tell us a little bit about it. So geography, you have the opportunity to tap into the world. And we've tried to do that in my class. We watched a video uh, about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, called The Promises of the Bay of documentary. And I thought to myself, I wonder if I could contact any of these people on here. And so I, okay. And so I, uh, I was able to do that. I found one of the uh, people that was in the film. So they, they filmed it about 10 years ago. He's now 26. He was from the ages of 9 to 16 when they filmed it. He lives in Jerusalem. He's a, he's a Palestinian Arab living there. And we went back and forth for a while about, you know, doing an interview session. Obviously, there's no way that I could fly him out to my class. I don't have the resources, nor do I think he'd really want to come. But I thought, if I could record an interview with him, how cool would that be for my students to be able to see the actual documentary and then have me interview him afterwards? 
And so it took about, I mean, really, it took about a year for us to finally get everything worked out. But two weeks ago, we got on Google Hangouts. We recorded it. I have a copy of it now. And I just showed it to my students yesterday. So it, and it was really just, as far as anything that I've done in the education field, it was right up there at the very top. Uh, the students watched it yesterday, and they were just in awe that here their teacher was talking to one of the characters that was in the film that they just watched. How much more do you want me to go on? Do you just have any questions? I mean, Jared's kind of one of the guys who's done this. If you have any questions about what he did or how he got started. Not Facebook, YouTube. It goes to YouTube. It will save as a YouTube video. And so what I did after it came up is I put it on private so that it's not out there for the public. And then I was able just to, you know, I just have that. It's automatically saved for me so I can just show it when I want. No. It just, as soon as you start, it just, it'll just record. And it goes right to YouTube. Now I put it on private, yes. So it's public when it's on there, you have to put it on private. Yes. I put it on private after it was done. I mean, we didn't tell anybody about it. Nobody's going to find it or anything. But after we got done, we j I just put it on private. And now I have a copy of it. Every, you know, every time we show this documentary, I can go back to it. I don't have to bug him every year. I don't have to have him come into all six of my classes and things like that. It's just a very good way to, especially if you have experts out there, it's really hard for them to come into your class, maybe teach the whole day, but you want all your students to see it. You know, here's a great opportunity. Find one of these experts. It doesn't matter what class you teach and, you know, get them to do a Google Hangout with you. You could include other students on there if you wanted to because you have the capability of having nine spots with you on there. Uh, I know that's been done as well. What happens is whoever is speaking shows up on the main screen. Everybody else is down at the bottom. Can you go right to your thing and show us so we can see kind of what it is? Sure. I got to get logged in, which we had trouble with earlier. But. <laughs> Let me show you one in the interest of time, because we were having trouble logging Jared in. Here's one that a friend of ours from uh, Leighton High School did. Uh, this is Jeff McCauley from Leighton High School. He's a marketing teacher. And he actually brought in everyone here to uh, pretty much a first. I'm going to pause it for a second. He brought in Damon John from Shark Tank. You watch that show on ABC? So he had one of the sharks come into his class. and. Uh, then he interviewed him, but also he used the other nine slots to invite marketing teachers from different schools around the country to be part of this as well. Now, Jared couldn't do that because of the time difference and a lot of those things, right? Like, I mean, he's talking to somebody who's eight hours ahead of us or seven hours ahead of us or something. That was nine o'clock at night. Yeah. So you can see that you kind of have to work that out. Let's just show you Jeff here for a second. Marketing the business in front of Jeff talks for a while. He's a good teacher. Um, I love the fact that a lot of students are utilizing Shark Tank as a way to uh, learn about... Okay, so Damon's sitting there in his L.A. studio looking very posh, as you'd imagine. And here come all the other teachers and students down on the bottom. So you can see people are just flooding into the bottom of that screen. And Jeff did a hangout on air, so it was recorded and broadcast. As Jared kind of mentioned, when you first do the broadcast... Um, it's live. Anyone who has your address can go watch it. Now, does that mean that it's like everyone in the world can go search it out? No, no, no. Right? It's, it's private with a link that means that other people can find it. Okay? So if you wanted to share it, yeah, you could share the link to your my, your my channel in YouTube. Other people could watch it. If someone happens to search you out during that hour that you're doing this live, yes, they could watch it. Okay? But that's really remote. Then, like Jared said, once the video filming was over, he just hit the make this video private in YouTube, and then he has a URL that he can share, but people can't find it unless he gives out that URL. So, just so we kind of clarify, yeah. It does automatically. Now, that can be problematic, right? 
Because you can imagine, if Jared's up there on the big screen, he's presenting, and I'm sitting in the background and I cough, what happens? It puts me up on the screen. So you can actually lock the presenter screen so that they stay up there the whole time. Because you don't want something like that where just a kid rustling papers picks up the, on the mic and then all of a sudden it switches over and kind of does some of that. So, so anyway, the, just another little fun one that maybe you haven't explored or haven't seen much of. But Hangouts on Air can be a fun way for you to share information with a large group of people. And like Jared said, it's recorded so he doesn't have to keep bugging that guest speaker six times in two days or every year when he wants to do that kind of a lesson. He's got it on file and he can show it when he wants to. And the students that missed it can participate just like the kids that were there or live. So, well, um, unfortunately, we're running a little short on time. It's 11.30 right now. I got 11.28 on my clock. And I think this session is supposed to end at 11.30, right? There were a few other things I listed on my handout. Um, if you have any questions about them, you can always contact me. Uh, my email is jared at uen.org. And I hope you take advantage. There's a lot of Google sessions during the two days here. You know, this was just the first one. Um, the rest of the time during this conference, I'm running the over-the-shoulder sessions. So if you head over to the gym and check out the vendors uh, in the back corner, you'll find that there's the over-the-shoulder session where you can learn about a lot of different topics. So I appreciate your time. Hopefully we shared some cool stuff with you today. Thanks.